In my experience, everyone will say they want to discover the truth, right up until they realize that the truth will rob them of their deepest held ideas, beliefs, hopes and dreams. The freedom of enlightenment means much more than the experience of love and peace. It means discovering a truth that will turn your view of life and self upside down. For one who is truly ready, this will be unimaginably liberating. But for one who is still clinging in any way, this will be extremely challenging indeed. How does one know if they are ready? One is ready when they are willing to be absolutely consumed, when they are willing to be fuel for a fire without end. And this week's opening quote comes from Adaya Shanti. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. Well, I almost didn't make it here with you again this week, folks. I've been hacked rather badly since my last two radio shows. Very strange. My computer seems to be going through all sorts of problems that I've never seen before. And I can't even get it to boot anymore. I've done all sorts of things, even down to replacing hardware and reinstalling the operating system and all sorts of things. And I still cannot get any joy from my main computer. So that's very interesting. So I'm working on that at the moment. I'm recording this on my laptop at the moment. Thankfully, I have my traveling laptop that I'm able to pull out and record this on for you. But it really has been a nightmare week. So... I haven't really got much done and I don't know whether I'm going to be able to provide much of a slideshow with this week's radio show simply because I've been wrangling with this system for the last five or six days trying to get my computer working and I'll keep you posted on how I go with that one. And it is kind of interesting folks, it really is. I mean I build my own computers, I've always built my own computers so I'm not completely stupid when it comes to how computers work. And I really have never seen any problems like the ones that I'm having. So very interesting, the timing of this event, but perhaps I'm just being conspiratorial. But anyway, what I've been talking about recently, of course, is history and the civilization of Great Tartaria that existed prior to this civilization. And the concept that this was actually quite a recent civilization, that history is wrong or we've been fed a complete crock and that there was a worldwide culture that existed prior to this culture that existed just a couple of hundred years ago, and that we've been fed a false history which has been fed to provide the backstory to lead us to this point, and to essentially justify the existence of government in its current form, and to justify all of these ongoing conflicts, all these wars that we see all around the world, to provide the necessary political background that we would perceive to be real, to allow these wars to continue, when really there seems to be a ulterior motive to the entire thing. And this appears to be a worldwide situation, folks, and I would suggest that all governments are involved in this cover-up. Not just some of them, but all of them. You know, I've said on the show many times previously that all of these theatres of conflict that we see are precisely that, theatre and that all of these governments work together. And when you really begin to look into the concept of this lost culture of Tartaria, it all begins to make sense, and it very much confirms that hypothesis. And when you look at this, I mean, I've been under a, quite a great deal of criticism from various people recently for discussing the possibility of the mud flood and for suggesting that there was no Roman Empire, that all of these buildings that we see all around the world were actually Tartarian buildings, and this was the Tartarian Empire, not the Roman Empire, and that the Roman Empire was created to give us a backstory to create the timeline in people's minds which would justify the existence of government in its current form, and to push the building of all these structures back to thousands of years or hundreds of years ago, and not just the building of them back hundreds of years ago, but more importantly the destruction of them back into the distant past when really they may have been built hundreds or thousands of years ago, but the civilization that built them still existed up until just a couple of hundred years ago, around about the middle of the 19th century, and that it was wiped out by this, what we're calling a mud flood, something, some event that happened which flooded them out, and the population was replaced by children who were just taught whatever history the controllers felt like teaching them. And this is 
really beginning to make a lot of sense, folks. I mean, when you look at the architecture all around the world, you look at all these buildings. I mean, some of them are incredible and they're so old. And have a look at the buildings, for example, here in Australia, buildings in the United States. Where did we get the know-how to build them? We didn't have machinery back then to be able to quarry stone and build these huge so-called Roman Grecian style buildings, which are everywhere. They're in every country all around the earth. How did everybody build these things? Why are they there in every single country? And why do they all look the same? And just think about it, folks. How did they do them and why would they do them? I mean, when you're just colonizing a country, the first thing you do is go and dig all these quarries and quarry all these stones and build these huge Roman and Grecian style government buildings. Think about it. Why would they do that? And how would they do that? They brought convicts out here, or so we're told. But these convicts, they just had mad stonemason skills, really did. They just went hard when they got here. They were able to go and dig all these quarries, quarry all these stones, transport all these blocks and build these huge Roman-style buildings, as you do when you're colonising a country. Think about it, folks. And there's actually a video that I found on YouTube by a YouTuber by the name of Jason. J-A-Y-S-O-N. And I'll leave a link below if you're watching this on YouTube. And I've asked his permission, I'm actually going to run the slideshow of the extent of these buildings around the world, just so you can see how many countries they are in. And really, when you look at the slideshow that he created, they all look like they're the same culture. I mean, honestly, half of them look like they're the same building. They all look like they come from the same city or the same country, and they're not. These are buildings from all around the world, and they didn't just do this because they liked the Roman style or because they were settled by Roman people. These types of buildings are in China, they're in Kenya, they're in Taiwan, they're in Japan, they're in Australia, they're in anywhere you can imagine and everywhere you can imagine. They're in the Philippines, they're in Indonesia. They are everywhere because this was a lost culture. This was a lost civilization that existed up until just a few hundred years ago. And all the wars that we're fighting now, uh, I would suggest ongoing wars to continue the destruction of this ancient culture. This is why they're wiping out all of the Middle East, folks. It's not about the war of terror. It's about destroying infrastructure. We've always thought it was about depopulation, and sure, there's probably a lot of depopulation in it, but mainly it's about destroying the infrastructure. That's why they wiped out Libya. That's why they're wiping out Aleppo, why they're destroying Yemen. That's what all the wars in Europe were all about. That's why they bombed Dresden so effectively, because Dresden still had many Tartarian buildings in there. But as I've mentioned before, I speculate that all of the wars that we know about, all the main conflicts, the Napoleonic War, the War of Genghis Khan, the Battle of Troy, which apparently was supposed to take place at around 700 BC, I would suggest that all of these wars took place contemporaneously around about the middle of the last millennia, and that all of them were wars for Tartaria, as was the Bolshevik Revolution, the war for Tartaria, the extermination of the Tartarian people, as was very likely the Black Plague, and it continued. And World War I and World War II were still battles for Tartaria, as are all of the conflicts that we're seeing around the world today. It's just that the people don't know it, because they're kept in a daze, because Their ancestors were brought to these countries as children, and cover stories were created, the cover stories of slavery, the cover stories of this and the cover stories of that. You can't believe any of it. You know, really, when you look at this and you look at the extent of the remains of this civilization all around the world, you can't believe a word we've been told about our history. The whole thing has been a complete crock. The races have been moved around and mixed up. Boatloads of children of all races, colours and creeds brought to all different countries and mixed up together and cover stories created to justify why these people are there and to justify why the world is in the state that it's in. But the whole thing is one big play. And all of these governments are working together, folks, all of them. Like I said, you can find remnants of this culture in every country on earth. You can find it in every country in Europe. You can find it across Africa, find it in Australia, find it in China, in Japan, in Iran, across the Middle East. They're all involved in this cover-up. All of these wars, who wants to be the bad guy? Who wants to be the good guy? Let's just keep it going, keep the theatre happening, and keep the people distracted and running on the treadmill. Take their children from them early and teach their children a false history. 
and it's easy to do. You know, and when I think back at my childhood and I think back at my mother and the people that were around in the 50s and 60s when I was a child, all these people were drugged. All of them were drugged. My mother was drugged. She was on medication. She was taking Bex powders and drinking sherry. Everybody I knew, all the people, all the housewives were all on Vincent powders and Bex and all of these fancy prescription drugs and drugs you could just buy at the drugstore over the counter that were really strong too, some of these drugs, folks. Some of these Vincent powders and, oh, look, there's a pretty pink one and there's a yellow one and there's a white one. What flavor do we want today? All of these things were mind-numbing. And the vaccinations and the alcohol and then the programming through the television, this false history that everybody's been fed. And so that now when you question it and you show them the evidence that is right there in front of their faces lying all around the world, they look at you like you've got two heads and you're a complete idiot. The amount of attacks that I got on that radio show that I put out a couple of weeks ago, I put it out on YouTube as well, called History is a Lie, We've Been Set Up was very telling folks and someone actually commented he said the curious thing about this video is there is an overwhelming amount of positive responses in as much as the overwhelming amount of votes is positive there's like 9,000 upvotes and 1,000 downvotes and yet the overwhelming amount of comments is negative saying this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You shouldn't listen to this video. Don't listen to this. A lot of people don't want you listening to that video, and they're making that very clear in the comments section. But again, the overwhelming response to that video has been positive, and I've received an enormous amount of emails in response to that video as well. So there are a lot of people responding really well to this information. And a lot of people are researching this information at the moment as well. A lot of people are looking into the mud flood. A lot of people are realizing that history is completely false, that virtually everything we've been told is a complete fabrication. Now, something else that I mentioned last week was the concept that they had technology, lost technology, the technology that we don't know about. Technology such as Tesla technology, what we would call Tesla technology, that they were able to harvest energy from the field, from the ether. And I suggested that certain buildings were built this way. And this information is not unique to me. There's a lot of people that are talking about this online at the moment, and there's a lot of sense in what a lot of these people are putting forth. And there's a lot of sense in the concept itself. That's something else that got received rather interestingly. It got a mixed response, but what I used to demonstrate this was a crystal radio set. You know, when you look at a crystal radio set, you've got crystals, you've got copper wire, you've got a configuration of these things in a certain way attached to certain grounding metals, and it creates a field whereby you have power, enough power to run a radio, and also you're able to pick up a signal simply through the crystals and the copper wire. And I suggested that this is the way a lot of these buildings are built as well. And really, folks, when you look at some of these buildings, you look at some of these churches, you've got the copper top roof, you've got all of these copper arrays and spirals that happen very often in the roof, all these very weird configurations. And in very old churches, you'll find that the stained glass windows are also made of crystal. So you've basically got a big crystal set there as the church. I mean, you've got a machine. You've got something that has all of the elements of a crystal set, a crystal radio set, something that produces energy. Then you've got these organs producing this organ music, and I suggested this was a type of healing music. Of course, you probably could use it as something that would do the opposite as well and cause damage. But really, when you think about it, why is it even called organ music? Perhaps it's called organ music because it's music for your organs, because it's healing. And that's perhaps what these churches were. They were perhaps places of healing and not so much places of worship. Another very interesting thing about these churches, many of them, when you look at them, anybody who is familiar with cymatics, the practice of putting frequency through sand, you know, put sand on a steel plate, put a frequency through it, and the sand creates these patterns, these geometric patterns on the metal plate. When you look at many of these church windows, the stained glass windows that are actually directly above the organs, many of them look like the patterns that are generated by cymatics. So this also lends a lot of credence to this concept. 
You know, sound and frequency has a very, very major effect on our organism, and it has a very major effect on all aspects of life. You can create earthquakes through sound. You know, when you build a building, when you build a high-rise, you need to know the resonant frequency of the high-rise that you're building because of the machinery that you're putting in. Anyone who works on high-rises knows this. Any structural engineers will know this. You know, if you're building a high-rise building and you're putting things like air conditioners in there and machinery, which is going to be working and creating a, a hum or a frequency or a resonant noise, you need to know the frequency, the resonant frequency of the building and make sure it's different to the type of air conditioners and things that you're putting in there. Otherwise, you can collapse the building. Because of the vibrational resonance, you can set up between the resonant frequency of the building and the machinery you're putting in it. You know, sound really does affect us in many ways. And if you can consider this and consider everything we know about sound and consider the possibility of what could be achieved with these churches and the healing that could possibly well have been achieved through the application of sound frequency and organ music, it really is not that unbelievable for this to be what was actually going on and for this to be the real reason that these buildings were constructed in the manner that they were. It also adds a whole new spectrum to the reason of why they changed the key of music as well. And many people who have looked into this, many people are aware that a couple of hundred years ago, the church changed the key of music. They raised it from 420 cycles to 440 cycles. They just raised it that little bit up, about a half a step, a half a tone, half a semitone. So that all the music we listen to now is slightly out of sync with the resonance of the earth, the harmonic resonance of the earth. And so that brings all of that into question as well. And it adds a whole new spectrum as to why they would have done that. And if you can think about music and frequency as being healing, and you can think about what would happen if you change that and change the key of music so everything that we're listening to is slightly discordant with the ambient resonance of the background. Then it makes a lot of sense. It really does make a lot of sense why they would have done that, and it makes a lot of sense as to why the human condition has deteriorated so drastically, why we've lost all of these skills, why we are so confused in our minds. I mean, there's so many things that they've done to us anyway, but thinking about it from the concept of music and the concept of sound, I mean, everything is light and sound. We know this. When you break everything down to its component parts, everything is simply photon light and phonon sound. I talked last week about how Royal Raymond Rife was able to heal all diseases by using sound, the application of sound and light frequency. When you understand how this works, folks, it makes perfect sense that we would have had societies that are based on this and we would have had whole healing systems set up. And when you think about churches and you think about crystal radio sets, you think about the power of organ music and being called organ music because it's music for your organs, all of this begins to make sense. And really when you look at it, I mean, we've had so much stolen from us, folks. It's very difficult not to get angry when you think about this stuff. You feel really ripped off when you look at the world and look at how the world was. Those pictures that were painted by people like Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci that showed paradise. And that is how we were living, folks. We were living in a world that was virtually paradise until the parasites came along and they stole it all from us. Stole our technology, wiped out the population that was here, replaced that population and hid our history and changed our history and fed us this false history to keep us locked into this false paradigm that we currently think is reality. This reality based on economic models. This explains why I felt like the world was so alien when I was born here. When I woke up and I really became aware of my surroundings when I was four years old, I really seriously thought I'd been born into the wrong reality. And when I look at reality now and I see the remnants of this culture, which are everywhere, all around us, hidden in plain sight. We've just built buildings around the old buildings and gradually pulled the old buildings down. But what you can see it, it's still there. It's hidden in plain sight right in front of our eyes. And when I think of the culture that we had and the technology that we had available to us and the harmonious state that we were very likely living in right across the world, it's very difficult not to get quite angry about it 
and to feel quite ripped off about what's been done to us and where we've been led. And as I said, folks, all the governments are involved, all politicians are involved. There's many of them who probably don't really know what's going on that are probably just as programmed as most of the people in the general population, but certainly the ones at the top have full knowledge of what is going on and exactly what's been taken from us and where we've been led. And I have absolutely no doubts about that at all. And it really is quite a confronting realisation to wake up to, folks. It really is. That's why the last couple of shows have received so much negative response because it is very much a bitter pill for people to swallow and it's a hard pill for people to swallow. It's a difficult one as well. I mean, I'm someone who's looked at history my whole life. I've spent most of my teenage years and adult years as a hobby researching history and trying to figure out how we got to this point, why we are in such a mess. And it's a shock for me to realize that I've missed this incredible clue that's been right there in front of my face all the time because I've been looking at all these ancient places all around the world and putting it all back thousands of years in time and not seeing what's right in front of my face in my own cities, in my own country. I mean, in looking at history and trying to figure out what happened, you associate it with places that exist in history. You look at history books. That's the first place you go is history books. And then you go to these places. You go to the old places in Europe. You go to Egypt. You go to where you think the history is. But what if the timeline's wrong? That's the thing. You just assume the timeline to be correct because, well, that's what we're told in the history books. That's what we're given in school. We're told it started at point A and it got to point Z. And so again, you go to all these places, you go to all these places overseas, you go to all of these ancient artifacts to have a look and see if you can figure it out because that's where you think the history is. But you don't look in your own city, in your own country and associate that with anything that existed in what we would perceive to be the ancient past. And you never question, is that past really so ancient? I mean, you look at this, you just don't associate it with Egypt or Europe or whatever. You see these buildings in Brisbane or Sydney and you think, oh, this is just built by the English settlers. But you really have to jump so many hoops to believe that. You know, and the problem is it's just something that you take at face value because it's what you're told at school. They just give you these school books. They say, oh, yeah, the settlers came, they did this. Okay, no problem, move on from there. But you have to look at it. How did they do that? We never asked that question when we were at school. If the settlers came and built these buildings, how did they build these buildings? How did they have the tools and know-how, the skill, the manpower, anything that they would have needed to build these buildings? They didn't. The buildings were already here. And not only were they here, they were everywhere all around the world. And it's a bit of pill to swallow, folks. But again, it's right there, right in everybody's face, hidden in plain sight. We just don't see it because it is so obvious right in front of our noses. Sometimes the most obvious clue is the most deceptive. But as I said, a lot of people have been looking into this. And the interesting thing is that this is where everybody's research has led them. I mean, my research has led me to these conclusions independently. And when I search, I find other researchers have also come to the same conclusion. And this is very refreshing when you find this sort of stuff. It's really good to see so many people coming onto the same page and talking about this sort of stuff. I even saw an interesting interview that someone sent me the other day. Well, interesting discussion anyway that someone sent me the other day by someone that I wouldn't normally look at, someone that I don't particularly respect simply because they introduced themselves to me about a year ago and their introduction to me was an attack, an expose they did claiming I was a CIA agent that was covering up for pedophiles simply because I'd done a show on ayahuasca. This person was claiming that ayahuasca is part of an MK Ultra CIA program, lumps ayahuasca into the same basket as LSD, but I would suggest that there's a higher agenda. I would suggest that the entire LSD MK Ultra program was designed to, among other things, lump ayahuasca into that basket so that people wouldn't look there because I think there is actually a lot of healing to be found in ayahuasca. But anyway, that's a, another story to get on to. But this person actually did an expose on me claiming I was a CIA agent and all sorts of blah, 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 and which caused me to basically disrespect this person by default. But I decided to overcome that little hurdle and put my ego aside. And the person I'm referring to is Jan Irvin. 
This is actually the way Jan Irvin had introduced himself to me, how I'd first become aware of his work. He'd done an expose claiming that I was a CIA agent. But anyway, the other day someone sent me a video on Tartaria. They said, Max, have a look at this. This is quite an interesting take. I saw it and I thought, ah, this is Jan Irvin, that guy who attacked me last year. I don't think I'm interested. But I thought, well, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and I'll watch the video. And it was actually a very good discussion discussing Tartaria, and it actually reinforced some of the suggestions I'd made on previous shows. A few shows ago, I suggested that the ancient religion that existed before whatever the cataclysm was that destroyed this last culture was a worldwide religion and that all the religions work together. That essentially the Bible and the Quran were different chapters of the same book, as were all the religious texts. And in this conversation that I saw between Jan Irvin and a gentleman by the name of Robert Rowe, they discussed exactly the same thing. And they also pointed out some very interesting connections to Genghis Khan and all sorts of things that we've been looking at as well and have very much come to the conclusion, the same conclusion, that all the religions work together. All of the religions were essentially chapters of the one book and that something happened and most of the other chapters were hidden and just the Christian Bible and the Quran were pushed forth in opposition to each other to create this divide and conquer mechanism. So yes, Jan, if you happen to be listening to this, totally not with you at all in your views with ayahuasca. I think you're right out of line there. I think you need to look deeper and completely not with you in your attack against me claiming I'm a CIA agent for having a different opinion to you. And it's a shame that you decided you wanted to introduce yourself to me as my enemy rather than wanting to be friends and discuss things. But aside from all that, great conversation with Robert Rowe and very interesting connections on ancient religion and even more interesting, the connection with Genghis Khan. I think a lot of people will be very surprised at that one. But yeah, I do recommend that you have a listen to that one, folks. And the video was entitled How the New World Order Killed the Old World Order and the Fake History of the Earth. And it's a very interesting take that they've done. A very interesting conversation they had. There appears to be a whole group of people who are dedicated to researching Tartaria and trying to uncover the truth about what really happened in our past. And it's great to see so many people doing that. So if you are watching this on YouTube, I'll be sure to put a link to that video below. Again, that was on the same channel as the slideshow showing the buildings all around the world, and that is on the channel by the YouTuber called Jason. Again, I'll have a link below in the description if you happen to be watching this on YouTube and not listening to it on the American Voice Radio. But folks, I think we have reached break time here, so I'll leave it there for now and we'll go and have a break. Thank you for joining me on there today. It's always a pleasure to have your company, and I'll be back to speak to you again in a few minutes. And welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, yeah, so I find it really fascinating, all of this stuff. And the concept of ancient technology is something else that I find incredibly fascinating. The concept that we had ethereal technology, that we were harvesting energy from the field, the concept that things were very different to the way they are now, and that this has all been stolen from us. And as I said, it may seem completely outrageous to a lot of people, but when you look a little deeper at things, it really begins to make a lot of sense. When you see all the evidence that's lying around the world to suggest this to be a real possibility, it does make a lot of sense, folks, because there's no other way to really explain all of this stuff. And I've spent years, literally 40 or 50 years, I've spent looking around the world trying to figure out why all of these artifacts are where they are. What happened? How all of this ancient technology could exist? How so-called modern historians and modern academics, mainstream academics, could have missed all this stuff and be so ready to dismiss it so willingly? And really, the evidence of ancient technology is overwhelming. You know, the evidence to suggest that everything they've told us about the progression of technology is a complete crock. They know that there's ancient technology. They, of course they know. I mean, you look at this stuff, folks, and you can tell. As I said earlier, this hasn't been simply an overlooking of history. It's been a deliberate cover-up. And as I said, a lot of people have been looking into this. 
And in the spirit of that, you know, it's really important that people see the unity that this could create with the human species. It, it really is important. It's an important issue, folks. It really is. And in the spirit of that, we need to put our differences down and be prepared to look at each other's research. Now, a friend of mine actually commented on one of my videos the other day and commented on someone else's video as well. He said he himself has been quite guilty of attacking people, for example, attacking flat earthers who have a different opinion to him. And this has been an ongoing thing, folks, for the last three or four years. We've seen the flat earthers and the globe earthers going hell for leather at each other. And I get attacks from both camps because I don't buy into either model. But ultimately, what we all are, as was said by my friend, ultimately, we are all earthers. It doesn't matter whether you believe the earth is flat or whether you believe it's a globe. It doesn't matter. We are all earthers in the end, whether you're a globe earther or a flat earther. You're still an earther. And some of the Flat Earthers have been doing some quite remarkable research. And if Flat Earth has inspired that in people and it's inspired people to look into these things, well, that's a good thing. And so you can't be too angry at some of these people and you need to be prepared to look at some of the research, even if they think the Earth is something different to what you think it is. It doesn't matter. We'll find out all this stuff out later. Once we're free, we can put all the arguments down. But for now, some of the Flat Earthers have been doing some very, very remarkable research, especially into areas such as the mud flood. And one person who stands out in particular is a Welsh guy by the name of Martin Leedke. And he really has done some fantastic dot connecting in as much as the mud flood and even talking about the possibility of what the fasci are actually used for many people are familiar with the fasci it's seen everywhere it's the symbol that we're given for fascism the axe with the bundle of sticks wrapped around it we're told this is about corralling people together making them strong one nation all this sort of stuff he is suggesting through his research that that is not what a fasci is at all that actually it's some type of energy weapon and he's actually got some pretty compelling reasons for thinking that and he's got some pretty compelling evidence that he's presented. And I will put a link to his video below as well. And again, folks, you've got to put your prejudice aside to look at this stuff. I mean, he calls his videos Flat Earth British. And then he goes on from there and he calls himself Flat Earth British, which kind of puts me off. I had a bit of a word to him and said, look, you're really limiting your audience and you're limiting the spread of this information because it's very difficult to share videos that are labelled Flat Earth British at the very start. It's going to put off so many people from watching it. But as I said, try to put that aside, folks, and just look at what he's talking about, because there's some very, very interesting stuff on this one particular video where he's talking about the fasci and what they were possibly used for. And even if that's a bit out there and may not be something you agree with, it's still a possibility. And it was mentioned in World War I that they were using electric fasci. So it's interesting to think about what that might have been. And I won't put the research here, I won't cover that in this video because I simply don't have time, but I'll put the link to his discussion below. It's about 40 minutes or 45 minutes or something like that. It's quite interesting. An interesting thing to me about it is that a lot of it parallels my own research. And to me, this is a good thing. As I said, when I see a lot of people coming to these same conclusions, it's very inspiring, irrespective of what their belief system is. And people have to be prepared to do that, and you have to be prepared to do that. If you want to be a real genuine researcher, you've got to be prepared to look at all information, regardless of what the belief system is behind it. Now, if you're not prepared to do that, then we'll never get anywhere. But something else he talks about is frequency and sound frequency. And he talks about World War I. And really, when you think about World War I, folks, what was the most commonly read thing about World War One. World War One is synonymous with, more than anything, mud. There was mud everywhere in World War One. Everyone had foot rot. People were dying in the trenches from foot rot. People were literally drowning in the trenches in World War One. Nothing would work. None of the machinery could get through. They were dropping bombs on people. The bombs would simply splatter in the mud and wouldn't explode. Nothing works when it's raining. And the amount of mud was absolutely off the charts. It was everywhere. So where did all the mud come from? Now, very interestingly, they had devices in World War I called acoustic locators. This was before they had radar because they had airplanes in World War I. They had the old biplanes. 
but they didn't have radar to be able to spot the planes. So the only way they would know the planes were coming was to hear them. And so they set up these elaborate listening devices that they used to hear the planes. And these were called acoustic locators, very weird devices. A man would be standing there with two huge horns, two huge conical horns on a stand with a couple of tubes going down attached to his ears. So he was basically extending the size of his ears so he could hear things a great distance away. And these came in all sorts of shapes and sizes, but some of the things that were given, some of the things that are actually depicted in World War I that we are told are acoustic locators really do not look like acoustic locators. What they look like are sound frequency generating devices. And when you think of the concept of frequency generating earthquakes, generating building collapses, generating landslides, and quite possibly frequencies that are capable of creating mud, it stands to reason that this is possibly what was being used in World War I, that this technology actually existed and that this is how the mud flood that we're talking about actually occurred. I know it's really out there for people to think about. But again, some of these devices that we are told are acoustic locators really do not look like acoustic locators. Some of them look like very bizarre electromagnetic type of weapons and other ones, well, they look like giant saxophones or giant tubers that are capable of producing quite low frequency sounds. It could quite conceivably be a device, some kind of a device, that was being used to turn an entire region to mud. And I know that's a really out there thing for people to think about. And people are going to go, well, that's a huge stretch, Max, and you've completely lost the plot. But again, look at the research of people like Nikola Tesla. Remember that device that he made that he attached to the building that time that caused an earthquake in the town that he was living in? And so the story goes anyway. Look at the research of Royal Raymond Rife, what he was able to do through sound frequency. Again, look at the concepts of acoustic resonance in buildings and the things you have to be aware of when you're building a high-rise structure. And just put all this together, folks, and really, it's not that inconceivable at all. All you have to do is think just that little bit outside the box, not even too far outside the box. Just look at the technology we've got available to us already and the things that we already know. And just apply that to this understanding and apply that to this situation and you can kind of see what's going on here. And it's really not that much of a stretch of the imagination to realise that this is what was very likely happening. So the question is, was this the type of technology that was used to create the mud flood? Was this the type of technology that was used in wars that were fought for Tartaria? And was this technology still in use as recently as World War I and possibly even in World War II? And, of course, is this technology still in use today? You know, you look at the forest fires, you look at some of the fires we're seeing in California these days, people are saying directed energy weapons. Well, is this what these fasci are is this what is being used to create these fires these fires in northern california now and the fires that we've seen here in australia as well which again were very bizarre we've got fire tornadoes happening here in australia as well you have never seen anything like a fire tornado before but apparently now it's all very commonplace this is simply what you get when there's a fire you get a fire tornado very interesting folks how the script changes as you go over the years you know these are things we never saw of or heard of when I was a child we've had a lot of bushfires in this country I've never heard of fire tornadoes until very recently but apparently now they're quite common and we're seeing them everywhere but again is this this same technology is this the type of technology that you're seeing with these fasci and was the mud flood the result of the generation of sound frequency? Is this what all these churches and what all this technology and all this stuff really was all about, folks? And when you think about it, it actually makes a great deal of sense. But again, I will put a link to Martin Liebke's video below in the description below. I seem to be putting a lot of links to videos in the description below. And it's good to do this, folks. It's good to share information and it's good to see the research community coming together. And like I said, through all this, you've got to put your belief systems aside. It's important that 
people allow others to think differently. It doesn't matter what shape you think the earth is. It doesn't matter if you think the earth is a globe and this person actually thinks the earth is flat. It doesn't matter. Have a look at the research on the mud flood. Have a look at the research on sonic weapons. Have a look at the research. Some of the things that he's saying about the connections that we've made to Great Tartaria. I mean, this is something that could possibly bridge the gap between the globers and the flatters and the many different fields of research that all seem to be competing for the truth. Perhaps we can all realise that there's a common truth and that all of the histories have been mixed up and divided. All the stories have been changed. Little snippets of history have been taken from this group and applied to this group and moved to another place in the world and everything's been changed. All of the stories are probably true to some extent, but where do they all fit? Where do they all fit into the timeline? How do they all fit with each other? Which stories are related to who? Who did what? Where did we come from? I mean, even when you look at the stories of Ulysses, what did Ulysses write in his memoirs? He wrote that there was a green island to the west of Greece, which he called Syria. And the only green island we can find to the west of Greece is England. And Ulysses named this as Syria. And there's all sorts of suggestions that that is where Surrey gets its name from. So this is what I mean, folks. They've changed everything. They've moved everybody around. They've changed everything. They've changed all the history. They've confounded the language all the languages, they've mixed the whole thing up and divided the entire human race and they've played everybody off against each other and it's so important that we put it all down because all of this research is coming out now. All this information is coming out, all the information about the foundlings, how they moved thousands upon thousands of children all around the world and they repopulated the world with children, all of this stuff is coming out. All of the ancient technology, how they're doing this, how they did it, and even who did it? You know, when you think of Tartaria, you think of the fall of this nation. Well, there's another nation that comes into mind, which was very close to there, called Khazaria. And I would suggest the war and the fall of Tartaria was very likely the result of the wars of Khazaria. And Khazaria is another nation that has been expunged from history. Not too many people know about that. But these are two very, very important nations that had a huge effect on where we are today. And again, folks, the evidence for this is all over the earth. All you have to do is look. And you've got to think outside the box again and be prepared to look at all the research that people are doing. Because if we can do this and put our differences aside, I think this is something that could really bring people together at a time when we really do need to come together. We really do, folks. And were we to come together, things would change. They really would. You know, you think about World War I. And something people don't know about World War I is how World War I actually ended. Now, we're just given this story about how it was started. You know, there was an assassination. England had actually been defeated by Germany quite quickly. And then America got involved, sinking of the Lusitania, blah, blah, blah. Ended up with the Treaty of Versailles. Germany lost the war. You know, the Axis powers that we're told lost the war and ended up having to pay retribution. We're told they lost the war, but was it really that way? Did Germany really lose the war, or did the war just stop? Because really when you look at it, you find that the war just stopped. The people simply stopped fighting. If you really look at it, folks, you'll find that all the troops were rebelling. There were protests in the streets in London. Everyone wanted the war to stop. There were protests in the streets in Germany protests in the streets in Russia, all the people were in protest of their governments, nobody wanted to fight, and the soldiers on the front line simply stopped obeying orders. They just said, no, we're not going to do this anymore, this is ridiculous, we're out here drowning in mud, we're not going to do it anymore, we're not going to fight your wars, we want to go home, and they did. And that saw the end of the war, it was a simple act of non-compliance, ladies and gentlemen. You know the old statement that what if they threw a war and nobody came? It's really as simple as that. And that's how we defeat the system, through non-compliance. You know, if we don't comply with our own slavery, then the system cannot exist. If we don't go and fight these wars, they cannot be fought. If we don't work in the bomb factories, then the bombs cannot be made. If we don't pay our taxes, then the government doesn't have the funding it needs to do what it's doing. I mean, it'll probably get it from the corrupt bankers anyway, but the thing is, folks, We've been played. We've all been played. All of this divide and conquer mechanism, everybody has been played. Even the truth community has been played. 
There are so many infiltrators, so many contrarians, so many people saying, oh, don't trust this guy, don't trust this, don't trust that. People still say, oh, don't trust him, he's got one-eyed symbolism on his website, as if that actually means something, folks. Even though I've got the one-eyed symbolism opening, you see it on all my videos. When you open my videos, you see the one-eyed symbolism, and then it opens up into two eyes, and we start growing leaves and branches and coming back to nature. I try to reclaim that symbol and bring it back to something that means something, but it doesn't matter. People will still read it as whatever they want to read it as, because that's what they do. That's the programming that they do. And people that are out there creating these divides, and even people that are attacking those who have a different belief system, the extremists on both sides of the globe earth and flat earth debate, those who actually waste time creating videos debunking flat earth, what for? Those who waste time creating videos debunking globe earth, what for? It's a prison. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you believe. You won't ever find the truth. The argument will continue until you become free because you're never going to be free enough to put the argument to rest until that time. And the very argument that you're creating, the division and the distrust that the argument is creating is one of the very things that is preventing that freedom from ever being achieved. So it is to allow people to think differently. If someone thinks the Earth's flat, it doesn't mean all of their other research is stupid. If someone thinks the Earth is a globe, it doesn't mean all their other research is stupid. It doesn't matter what you think this construct may be. It's completely and utterly irrelevant at this point. What is relevant is us realizing that everything has been a lie and realizing just how much we've been played and coming together at what is one of the most important times in the whole history of this realm that we live in, whatever this realm turns out to be. You know, as I've said so many times in the past, divide and conquer is the motto and is used against us in every aspect of our lives every single day. And when you look back and really step back and look at everything that I've shared on the last few shows, the concept of this lost culture, the concept of the foundlings, the mud flood, replacing the population with children, you can see just how easy it was for them to change history and to hide this civilization that existed not too long ago. But it's there, it's right in front of your face if you just have the eyes to see it. Open your eyes and look around, wake up from the slumber. You know, we're all running on the treadmill, running at 90 miles an hour, doing all this stuff that we think is important, but it isn't. We're doing absolutely nothing. And what we are doing more importantly than anything is failing to pay attention to our surroundings. I mean, there's a war being waged against us and we don't know it's happening. We're being poisoned, folks. We're being poisoned in every single aspect of our lives. Even me, I'm 61 years old now and I feel like I've just become an adult. I shouldn't be getting old now. I should be living much, much longer than what I am. I'm not supposed to be getting decrepit and old and be dead at 80. I'm supposed to live to two or 300 years old. You look in biblical texts, they're all 300 years old, 400 years old. This is the natural lifespan of humanity. The fact is that we are being poisoned and we are having a war waged against us now and we simply don't know that we're in the thick of the battle. We just have no concept which makes us all easy targets. You know, we've been taught to believe in this superficial, artificial reality, which simply is not real. And the reality that we had and the reality that we are capable of having again is right there in front of us, if we could just see it. You know, we really had a number done on us, ladies and gentlemen. We really have. And I know a lot of this is totally out there for people. The whole concept of there being no Roman Empire, the whole concept that all of our history was fabricated, the concept that a lot of the myths that you hear are actually true. A lot of the stories of giants and the Norse gods and things that we would deem to be mythology or magic. Things that are there in fairy tales and really, if you look, things that still exist within our collective memory. We're taught that all of this was fantasy and fiction, but what is the real fantasy and fiction is the wall that's been pulled over our eyes and this false matrix that we're living in. This is why you can see there is no remedy in politics. There is no remedy in anything this system can offer you. doesn't matter how good you think Trump is. Maybe Trump's just completely programmed into believing that reality is real and he's trying to do the right thing, but I doubt it. 
I think they're all bought and paid for, folks. I think every politician in any position of real power knows exactly what's going on and knows what all these wars are being fought for. The whole thing is the ongoing war for Tartaria and we are being exterminated. All the people on the earth, everybody is being played off against each other and the earth is being depopulated by those that we believe we employed to positions of power to run our infrastructure for us, but really they're just all part of the same crime gang, all part of this culture which is destroying the real culture that we should have had, this parasitic culture that they've introduced over our reality. You know, whether they're hiding land beyond the North Pole, whether there's a continent on the Earth that we don't know about. You look at the work of Admiral Byrd, some of the diaries that he wrote, some of the stories that he wrote, he indicated there was hidden land. And no, that doesn't mean the Earth is flat either. We don't know what shape the Earth is, and I'm sick of arguing about it. But it's very likely that they are hiding land. And it's very likely that there's people on this Earth that we simply don't know are here. And that's possibly who's doing all this. Who knows? Some people say it's reptiles, some people say it's aliens, some people say whatever, it doesn't matter. What's doing it really when you come down to it is us because we're complying with our own slavery, mainly because we don't know what's going on. And most of society is frankly too drugged and too controlled in so many ways that they just don't see it. They're drugged by everything, not just drugged by drugs, they're drugged by television, drugged by their mobile phones, drugged by this digital reality they're being locked into. But there's a whole world out there that people haven't noticed, and there's a whole world right in front of their eyes that they haven't noticed either. Perhaps people will wake up to it now. If enough people talk about it, perhaps people will see it. Perhaps they'll see the importance of it. But we are at a very critical time at the moment, folks. We're at a crucial time in history because the lockdown is coming, and we've been talking about this mud flood and how they've reset population at least once or twice before. We don't know how many times they've done it. Maybe... They've done it more than that. But it would seem that they're about to do it again. It would seem that there is a depopulation event that is about to happen. I think far too many people are waking up, and those who are in control desperately want to keep control of the situation. And they know that if enough people wake up, they're simply not going to be able to do that. So perhaps there is some sort of an event coming. It would not surprise me at all. But even with that, it's just an opportunity. All these things are opportunities, opportunities for us to take responsibility for ourselves and ultimately opportunities for growth. And really, without growth, well, what's life all about? But folks, we are getting very close to that time again where we have reached the end of the show, so I'm going to have to leave it there for now. Again, I'm going to be speaking at an event called Illuminate down in Coffs Harbour around about January 18th. I'm trying to get a banner up on the website. I will get that banner up there this week. So all the people that are sending me inquiries about that event can go to my website. There will be a banner there, and they can click on the banner, and they can go and find out about it, get a ticket, whatever you need to do. There is another event that I'll be doing in Byron Bay the following day, and I'll also be speaking at Anacapulco in Mexico in February, and that will be the only international event that I'm doing next year. I really do want to take 2019 off travel and spend a bit of time at home. I'm going to be going from that event up to LA. I've got to do a few things up there. And then I'll be down in Peru for a couple of months. I've got a lot of stuff there I've got to pick up. But then I'll be back to Australia and I'll be working on the films and doing what I can to get that out to people by the end of next year. And I've been really slow on getting these films released because it's just difficult to do when I've got so much other stuff on. Thank you for all the kind words that you send me. Thank you for the so many emails that you send me. And I've got so many there to answer, folks. Please bear with me on the emails. I really cannot keep up with the amount of emails that are coming in. There's a couple of T-shirt orders that people have given me as well. I'm onto that. I will get those T-shirts out to you soon. Do bear with me on that. I'm trying to heal myself too, folks, through all this. I've been getting massages from my favourite masseuse, who's really good. And folks, I tell you, if you're anywhere near the Gold Coast in Australia, you're near Byron Bay, you're near the border of New South Wales, there's a health food shop in Coolangatta called Be Natural Health Foods. And in that health food shop is a girl called Polly. And she will give you the most amazing deep tissue massage. This is my own personal masseuse, so I highly recommend if you're in the area, you go get a massage from this girl because she's amazing. 
she's healing my body and doing a wonderful job of it. So a bit of a plug for you there, Polly, and I hope that helps you out because she does need it. And no, folks, I didn't get bribed into doing that. I just felt like giving her a plug because she deserves it. But folks, thank you to all the wonderful emails you send me. Thank you for all the kind support you send me. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. I could not do any of this if it wasn't for you, but that is it for me, folks. I'm now completely out of time, and I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. Please take very good care until then. In luck, cash.